Hey everyone, welcome to this episode of Compassion and Courage Conversations in Healthcare. I'm your host, Marcus Engel, and as always, this is the podcast where I teach compassionate communication, inspire resilience, and provide perspective. I could not be more excited to have my guest today. Uh, so I want to introduce to you a gentleman whom I not only respect and admire, but I truly, truly like just as a person. And this is a gentleman that I've had the privilege to know for nearly 20 years now. We both started into the speaking business right about the same time. And John O'Leary has set the world on fire with his message, his life story, and his leadership and education for so many people, including me. So John, thank you. Thank you for being here. And let's just, where do you want to start? I guess I want to start with this. Let me ask you this question. You know my book, I'm here, and it's based on presence. And I'm here in my studio today. Where is here for you? So I, I can't answer that until I, I echo what you said in the introduction. As a podcast guest and as a speaker and author, I get interviewed by a lot of folks. And normally they begin with the words, I want to bring on my friend, John O'Leary. And Marcus, uh, I, I'm meeting some of those folks for the very first time during that interview. I, I look at you and I listen to your voice and I know your story and I know the impact of your life. And, and when I get introduced by you as a friend, I'm so humbled by it and so grateful for it. So my friend of nearly 20 years, thank you for the honor of being on your show and for being your friend. Regarding where I am today, I am in St. Louis, Missouri. I am married here. I have four children here. I am an author and presenter here and, and run a podcast here in St. Louis as well. And that is an extremely humble way, humble way of introducing yourself because John has written two number one New York Times bestselling books. He is an incredible podcaster, an incredible speaker. And again, I, I don't know how much more I can say that, that it is an honor to have known you uh, for so long. I remember our, our very first time meeting and I got to hear you speak. I got to hear your story. And the next week we were hanging out, having coffee, talking about, okay, this is your goal for what you want to do with your story. And here's Marcus's goal for what I want to do with my story. And to see how those goals have evolved and been reached over the last couple of decades. Um, man, it's it good is to awesome. be with you. It's so I remember that speech. You. It was Rotary Kirkwood 15, 17 years ago, somewhere in that area. And, yeah. and you were in the middle of that room and I didn't know your story then. So to see you out there and I, I could tell that day, Marcus, you, you exude like presence. I mean, gosh, you live the message of your book. You live the message of your teachings. You lived it. You came up afterwards. We had a nice conversation and you said, listen, if you ever need anything in this line of work, reach out. And I needed a lot in this line of work. So I reached out the following day. You had me over for coffee. We connected as guys and as young speakers and as dreamers wondering how we could change the world through our stories. And, uh, and you certainly have. As have you. So so you got to share that you're in St. Louis. And of course, people know that my story starts out in St. Louis, Missouri, where I grew up a typical kid in the suburbs, just like you. And and I guess could we can we start today with the, let's start there. Let's start childhood. Let's start at the beginning of of the life of O'Leary. <laughs> can you take us back to uh, to childhood growing up in St. Yeah, Louis? I'm glad you didn't make me go all the way to the very beginning of the life of O'Leary. I think it started at a at a meatloaf concert from uh, my mom and dad. So uh, <laughs> not advance forward to I think what you're actually looking for. Uh, I had a normal, and now that you look, even in saying that word, shockingly privileged, amazingly blessed freaking awesome childhood. And it was so good and so ordinary. I did not know how great it was. Um, one of six kids, we've got a golden retriever. We have two parents who are truly happily married and committed to one another and committed in their faith and trying to do the best thing professionally and personally, active in the community. Uh, um, my grandparents are in the community. 
both grandfathers fought in World War II. The biggest fight we had growing up was one grandpa fighting with the other grandpa on who had it worse in World War II. The, the Navy in the Pacific or the Army in Europe. And so, Marcus, this was my childhood, man. It was just good. It was just yeah. good. And then, yeah. as you know from your event down at the Blues game, like in a blink of an eye, it all can change. So uh, for me, that, that happened on January 17th, 1987. I'm nine years old. I, I witnessed little kids in my neighborhood playing with fire and gasoline. And monkey see, monkey do. I, I assumed if, if these kids could do it, so could I. So on a, a Saturday morning with mom and dad gone, I walked into the garage, bent over a can of gasoline, tried to pour a little bit of fluid on top. And before the liquid even came out the fumes, grabbed my flame into the container, created a massive explosion, split the can in two, launching me 20 feet against the far side of the garage, covering me in gasoline, covering me a flame, and everything around me in the entire garage, Marcus, immediately was was on fire as well. So that, that's the turning point in my life. How much of it do you remember? Yeah, well, it, again, you and I share this recollection, actually. Mm -hmm. For me, everything. So a lot of times when you hear people yeah. tell stories, it's secondhand or thirdhand or maybe as I wish it had been. But for me, the, the way I remember the story is indeed what happened and what was verified by secondhand accounts. And so I remember bending over the flame and I remember the can blowing up and I remember being on the far side of the garage. And we were all taught in school to stop, drop and roll. Like that's what you do when you're on fire, kids. And I remember knowing that and looking down and seeing orange. And when you are orange, seeing orange as a child and you are in pain and everything is aflame, training goes out the window. And I just started operating from a place of fear. I, I panicked and I remember clearly running on fire through the flames into my parents' house. And Marcus, I got into the living room and stood on top of this rug. And there's a picture of it actually. And there, it's like this oriental rug with this just big black stain in the middle of it. And that's from where I stood that morning. And I'm standing on top of this rug, screaming and praying for a hero, you know, looking for a savior. And, and I see my brother, Jim, who was 17. And I remember as Jim's coming closer to me, my next thought was, this is true. Uh, God, anybody else, man, and not, not him. That's my older brother. He can't be the one. And yet Jim was the first hero to show up for me that day. He picked up a rug and beat down the flames, carried me outside. It took him two minutes two minutes of fighting a fire, you know, burning himself in the process and eventually saving my life and then running back inside, bringing out the dog, bringing out my sisters, calling 911. That day and then every day that followed was a reminder to a, a little boy who just got burned how badly he would need other people to show up with compassion and courage and commitment for him. And man, I was blessed to have it for my brother, to get it for my sisters, to receive it from my parents, and then to get it from each individual thereafter. So you are out in the front yard, right? Having just been burned, ambulance has been called, you get to the hospital, and I am sure that uh, looking back as an adult, you are awfully grateful that there was that very good burn uh, unit so close mm. to home. Well, for sure, it's it's a world class burn center here in the in the United States in St. Louis, Missouri, where you and I both grew up. So it's called St. John's Mercy back in the day. Now they call it Mercy. It is by ambulance, ninety two seconds from my house, and you know, in a story that's filled with miracles, this is just one more little little example. But there are countless. In fact, when when the first book came out. They on the cover of cover of it, Marcus, there was a picture of me wearing a suit with my arms crossed like, <laughs> look at me. And if you uh, if you strive enough, you too might one day be great like me. So I wrote them back and I'm like, guys, read the book, like, because really this thing's not about me. It's about community. It's about grace. Mm -hmm. It's about strangers showing up in a marketplace that is longing for it, and making a difference in both big and small ways. And so now when you when you hold on fire in your hands, this little book. I'm not on the front of it. I'm not on the back of it. And that's not out of, you know, false humility. I, I want our readers to and our listeners to recognize the story is about them. And the miracles that keep showing up in our story, Marcus, it's your story too. It's a story of individuals who just did their job well. 
It got probably in real time very little fanfare, probably got overlooked and underpaid and dealing with stress and anxiety at work and at home. But in doing their job, whatever that job was, well, a little boy with utterly no chance, no chance, spends five and a half months in hospital and then years of recovery afterwards, but has an awesome life because of them. Precisely, precisely. You take a nine-year-old kid or an 18-year-old teenager on the cusp of adulthood and not only put in very lucky circumstances of survival, medical survival due to extraordinarily uh, traumatic events, but to also then be able to survive the rest, right? Because the, the, the story just begins totally. with the trauma and how the life goes from there and the lives that become intertwined because of that trauma. Ultimately, I'm sure you would agree at this point in life, those are, those are the silver lining. That's the blessing. It's, it's the relationships we form along the way. It's the care we receive and it's the, it's the gift we get to continually give, uh, to those who saved yes. our lives. Yes. And yeah, it's not yeah. only the doctor. I know the story of your nurse and you had a whole lot of them, but you had one in particular that you write and talk and share about. I had that nurse and I had that doctor and one of my favorite leaders for me going through the recovery, you know, five and a half months in hospital. That's a long time to work at a hospital, let alone to be a nine year old going through amputations and skin grafts and surgeries and just struggle. Every day is hard. But one of my favorite caregivers was uh, actually not a caregiver. He was a janitor named Lavelle, custodial staff member. And uh, this guy would, would put his little walkie-talkie or like the little ear pods on my pillowcase every morning, and he would walk in and just do his job well. But in a time that was filled with so much darkness for me and so much negativity and so much stress and sadness, this one person's presence, Lavelle, and his music and his just subtle, humble spirit as he did his job extraordinarily well. I mean, I'm emotional thinking about it and talking about it because I, I don't always talk about Lavelle, but he is one of many reasons why you and I are buddies today and able to be part of this podcast together. You know, when when you talk about Lavelle uh, and and just knowing presence, acknowledgement. So I, I don't know if I've ever told you this or if we've spoken about this, but about four years ago, I began teaching pre-meds yes. at Notre Dame and I get the pleasure of teaching them what we call the art of being with. And we call that, uh, we talk about that, that compassion is witnessing suffering, being moved by that suffering having a desire to ease that suffering and then actually mm. doing something about it. And so we, whenever we, I think sometimes it helps to have a great working definition, but I also love the definition that we use, which is just witnessing without mm. judgment, witnessing without judgment and Lavelle witnessing, I, I think anyone would, would see an incredibly injured child and their heart should go out to them. Lavelle, like you said, gave you the gift of presence and acknowledgement. And that's, that is a, that's a beautiful story. So I always ask my guests uh, 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 to share a, a, a story about a time that someone was there for them or that they were there for another. Is that the story that comes to mind for you? Man, there are so many that that would not generally be the first that came to mind for me. The first, would you rather have it be a, a medical personnel or a... Hey, you can do whatever you want. We got all the time in the world. You share both all three. I'll, I'll start with medical like. and if you want other personality yeah. ask, but sure. the reason Lavelle was in some regards as compassionate, as focused, as mission centered as he was is because of his, and I'm using the finger quotes right now boss. His boss was chief of staff. His name was Vachi Vaj. And so feel free to share this with the medical students at, at Notre Dame. But this guy's so overworked. He's got a million things pulling at him in a million different directions. And every day he would come in and round, not just with other doctors, but he would round with the entire staff. 
So it was like a village rounding before that was common practice. One of the staff members rounding with him was Lavelle, but it was the entire team that would round every morning. And what this doctor would do is Vachyavajan, he would sit on my bed at a time where there was a large wall between doctors and patients, but this guy would bust through it. He would sit on my, my little bed and he would just look at me and he would say, how you doing? How you doing, superstar? How you doing, hero? How, how you doing, John, comrade? All these little terms that he would use every morning. And I would look at him and I would usually be honest and I would say, Doc, I'm scared. And I would talk about the night and the nightmares and the pain and the stress of, you know, back then I'm tied down to a hospital bed, unable to move during periods of time, unable to see, unable to communicate sometimes due to a trach, like really struggling. And this wonderful doc would just sit there and instead of responding, there was usually a long silence. And then he would say, I can't imagine. I, 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 I can't imagine. But after some back and forth, and as he's just being with me, being fully present, he would turn away from me and look at the staff and he would say, ladies and gentlemen, look at me. You have two eyes, two ears, and one mouth. Use them in proportion. And he would model this and he'd just keep asking me questions and then, then he would listen. And then one by one, he would remind the staff of the value of their work in impacting positively this patient's life. And he would round, you know, Lavelle, for instance, was reminded every morning by the doc that he was the most important person in the team because he was the one going into the corners. He was the one fighting back against infection better than anybody else. And then the doctor would say, Lavelle, thank you. Just thank you for your work, man. And then he would tell the PTs and the OTs and the speech therapists and chaplains and CNAs and RNs and the entire staff about their direct impact on this patient's life, reminding them of the effect of it and that it mattered. And so when you asked about presence, Vachyavajan, and again, I don't tell his story all that much either, but even to the degree that on the night he amputated my fingers, which for me was as painful a day as I'd ever experienced emotionally, because I went from being the starting shortstop for the St. Louis Cardinals in my future to recognizing I'm not doing that anymore. And it honestly just hurt me, man, to know that I'm not playing baseball. Sure. I'm not going to go back to school ever again. I'll never hold a little girl's hand. Like my life is over. I'll, I'll never do anything. So I knew this the night I had my fingers amputated. And I remember this doc comes into my room. Can you imagine the day he had? I had a day too, man. But his day, I was one of 11 patients he operated on. And he's got four kids himself and everything else in his life. And somehow he made time to come into my room late and just sit with me. So I remember, remember that presence. And then he said something to the, the effect of, John, I understand you're mad at me today. <laughs> Apparently news traveled. So I shared with him that, yeah, I was extremely mad at him and told him all the reasons why. And then he shared with me, John, I did not take your life today. I saved it. And he said, you may not become a courtroom reporter later on in life, but John, you can become a fine legal counsel or a judge. He said, you may not become a, a, a carpenter, but you can become a general contractor. You can run a huge construction company. He said, John, you may not play for the St. Louis Cardinals. You may not play for them, but you could manage them or you could own them. He said, John, I have not taken your life on this day. I have given you back the promise of it. And Marcus, this is a conversation. You hear the emotion, I think, in my voice. 34 yeah. years ago, man, I'm an old man now. 34 years ago, he took the time that at that late evening to encourage a little boy to keep dreaming and keep believing and keep fighting and keep praying and keep imagining that in spite of current challenges, better days were yet to come. And to put a little bow on this, later on in my life, I would not only become a general carpenter myself and a general contractor, I would become a carpenter of all things with no fingers, but I would become a, a carpenter. And later on past that, and after becoming a motivational speaker and writer, the St. Louis Cardinals, among other clubs, would invite me to speak to their teams. And so uh, this doctor 34 years ago had this vision that a little boy would have never cast for himself. And that, I want you to pick up on that in one second, but I, I'm so glad that, that you talked about being a contractor and a carpenter 
um, which I've heard you joke about saying that's a heck of a job for a guy that doesn't have a lot of uh, appendages, <laughs> right? <laughs> and so uh, I remember the first time you coming over to my house and, and I remember I asked you this question and I was a little concerned. I thought about asking it first, but I figured you're a survivor like I am. I'm going to throw some dark humor at you. And you came in and I believe it was in the winter time. And I said, and you I said, you know, I'm sorry. It's a little cold in here. My uh, fireplace, my gas fireplace went out. And I said, wait a second. I know that you're a contractor and uh, a carpenter. But I also know that you've been burned real bad. So would you like freak out if I ask you to help me get my pilot light lit again? <laughs> and the next thing I know, in our very first meeting at my home, you are down on my living room floor lighting the, the light in the gas fireplace for me. And therefore, we could have a comfortable conversation. Dude, that is so long ago. I barely, barely remember it. And I can't. I can't change a light bulb in my own house these days, but back in the day, I had some skills. So I'm glad we got that pilot lit, lit for you. You you had you had mad uh, handyman they and carpenter faded, skills. Marcus. They faded profoundly, man. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so so let's bring that back to um, how our hometown St. Louis Cardinals became such a profound change agent in the life of that extremely traumatized young man well you know, you know in your earlier question you asked about the power of presence and there there were two other people that came to mind immediately the first was a guy named don lee don lee was an english teacher at desmet jesuit high school uh, where my brother went to school and he taught jim english but he was uh, an introvert. He was very soft-spoken. He was a young guy, like 24-ish. And the reason he, I remember him is he would just come into my room and sit with me, this young, young guy. And we didn't talk about much, but I don't, I don't think we needed to. So like he was a powerful presence. And, there, and if you had my mom on your show and you asked her the same question, what she might remember is there was a night where she was just frazzled, like you know, months and months and months of a little boy on death's doorstep. And even if he survives, what kind of life will he live? And so my mother, after enough months of this was just fried, just totally, totally done. And at around midnight, she leaves my room and walks into the hallway and she's crying. And I never tell this story. So now I'm really emotional. She's just crying. And at midnight at night in a dark waiting room, there's a guy named Don Lee. He is seated by himself, grading papers from the day, just on the chance someone needs his presence just on the chance. And on that night, someone needed his presence. So uh, I think a lot of times we don't have the compassion and the courage because we think we're not smart enough. We're not articulate enough. We don't have a good enough vision, strong enough handshake, whatever the lame excuse we might give ourselves. And then you hear a story like Don Lee and you recognize, man, you don't need much other than showing up. And if you can do that well, that's good. That is really, really, really good. So Don is another powerful story of, of compassion and courage and action. And then the one that you hinted at with the question, in the first several months of recovering, for me, I was blinded. I, I spent the first couple couple months so swollen that my eyes could not see. So I can't see and I can't move and can't communicate due to the trach. But I could listen. And growing up in our community, your hometown of St. Louis, my my baseball team was the St. Louis Cardinals. And back in the 80s, the way we watched baseball was not with our eyes, Marcus. It was to listen. And the way we used to listen to baseball was with the voice of a guy named Jack Buck, our mutual friend, Jack Buck. So I never met this radio announcer, this Hall of Fame hero of, of mine and ours, but I certainly loved him. And I got burned on a Saturday in January. Sunday afternoon, I'm laying in a darkened, dying cocoon. I'm dying. I'm wrapped in bandages, head to toe, tied down to this bed, can't do anything for myself. And the door opens up and I hear footsteps. You know, it's amazing how you, when one sense is taken away from you, others begin to become even more elevated. So I hear these footsteps and then I hear somebody cough. <clears throat> and then I hear this voice and it's the voice of Jack Buck. And he says to me loud and clear, kid, wake up. You are going to live. You are going to survive. Keep fighting. John O'Leary Day at the ballpark will make it all worthwhile. Keep fighting. 
And then he walks out and he leaves me by myself changed. The power of presence. Sometimes it's in silence. Other times it's in a eight and a half second little pep talk you give to a patient or to a loved one or to the reflection in the mirror. The, the beautiful thing, and then I'll, I'll be quiet for a moment. The beautiful thing about Jack is when he walked out of my room, he was told by the staff that I was going to die. As many people who visited you were told also about you, Marcus. So this announcer now is told by the staff that this little boy is going to die. There's no reason for hope. And in spite of what he was told, the following day, this man I'd never even met before shows back up in my life a second time, sits back down into this little room with me and says the words, kid, wake up. You are going to live. You are going to survive. Keep fighting. John O'Leary Day at the ballpark. We'll make it all worthwhile. See you soon. And he kept that promise. Tell us about the fulfillment of that promise. Yeah. The balls, <laughs> the, the, the balls that kept coming and kept coming with more and more signatures and just an unfathomable amount of support for just a young kid from mm. the community, right? I, I, I always consider myself um, in some ways to be so blessed to be from St. Louis. I always say St. Louis is really just one big That's small right. town. Um, and granted, you know, St. Louis has got its, its, uh, its certain share of issues, just like any other major metropolitan area, but word travels fast, yes. right? Word travels fast. And those opportunities were presented because of kind of the close knit Midwestern community. Um, I also want to thank you, uh, before you tell about, uh, the ball, the balls and the therapy that it was for you. Um, thank you for sharing the story about your mom. Uh, I too, to this day, I, I can talk about my own experience. Um, I, I don't mind. I can tell you about the pain and the surgeries and all the recovery and loss and all that. But when I think about what my mom and dad went through, uh, it, that's one of the hardest things for me that I, that I even still yeah. struggle with. And, um, and I, I know that you have, have, and had such a fabulous, uh, set of parents, uh, it, to this day, such a fabulous set of parents. Um, you've been very open about sharing your dad's struggles with Parkinson's. How mm -hmm. is he doing? So there's a lot in, in the questions you let out there. The, the first is I do yeah. have awesome parents and I hope to someday have children that say the same about their parents. My wife, Beth and John, I mean, we, we have work to do, but we're striving to be like the parents that ours were and are for us. So, you know, regarding my father's Parkinson's disease, 29 years or so now with Parkinson's disease, unable to drive, unable to stand, unable to ambulate, unable to work and earn. Lately, Marcus, unable to speak clearly and recently struggling swallowing. And so you're like, oh, poor guy. And the most joyful, faithful, spirit led, beautiful guy I know. I was with my dad last night, taking him to a Billiken game later on this week. He's my he's he's my boy, man. I, I love this amazing yeah. example to me of, around not only what courage looks like, but around abundance and joy looks like. He has very little, and he has the world in his mind. So uh, he's awesome. I appreciate you asking. You you also asked earlier in the question around yeah. the Jack and the baseballs and and how he learned about it. So before we go farther into what else Jack did is maybe the question is how did he learn. He learned yeah. because my next door neighbor's name was Carol and she called a friend who called a friend who called a friend who called a dad. So we're five deep whose dad, the dad was named Red Chandings. So the beautiful gift of one plus one plus one and we change the world. We think it's going to happen in D.C. or Tallahassee, but ultimately the way the world gets changed is one relationship at a time and like humble backwater communities like St. Louis, but that, that's how you change the world, man, doing the hard work of loving the one in front of you. So one by one, these folks are doing the work. Red Shandians gets a call from his daughter, Colleen, that a little boy named John is dying in hospital and uh, won't survive. 
Keep them in your thoughts and prayers, Dad. So Red leaves that phone call, goes to a charity auction. He sits next to a guy with white hair, probably a Budweiser in his right hand. And while talking baseball, Red Shandings tells Jack Buck that a little boy was burned. His name is John O'Leary. He probably won't make it. Keep him in your thoughts and prayers, Jack. And the following day, I mean, this is just so good. Right? So it's not just like hearing something and saying, yeah, I, I, I will uh, I will share that on Carrying Bridge, which is a nice start. But the following day, a stranger shows up in a burn center, which is a very difficult place to go. And some of the staff listening to your voice right now, Marcus, they know that to be true. It's a very difficult unit to walk on to. Jack walks on, he scrubs up, puts on the gloves, puts on the mask, puts on the little booties, walks into a stranger's room and never lets go. Because one person reached out to one, to another, to another, to a dad, to a friend, and it's on. So that's how we change the world. So remain optimistic that your life matters because it does. So then Jack shows up once and then twice, and then over the next five and a half months keeps coming back into my life in hospital. And then on August 26th, picks me up in a Lincoln Town car, takes me downtown. We have John O'Leary Day at the ballpark. It was this, this awesome celebration of life that so many people have fought for and prayed for. And he learned that night, Marcus, that I can't hold anything with my hands. So he, he started sending me baseballs. And each ball would come with a note below with that red kid. If you want a second baseball, all you have to do is write a thank you letter to the man who sent the first. That's all you've got to do. But the problem is I can't hold anything. And the opportunity is to quit making excuses. So with, my, with a therapist on my left arm and my mother pushing on my right, they, they crush through some scar tissue. We hold a little pen in my hand, push together, mailed it off. And two days later, I got a second baseball signed by another Cardinal player with a second note that read, kid, if you want a third, kid, if you want a fourth and a fifth and a sixth. And 1987, one gentleman, with the help of a whole bunch of his friends, sent a little boy named John six, six, zero, 60 baseballs, teaching a little nobody that there is absolutely no such thing and that your life matters and to act like it. Wow. Wow. It, it is such a profound, a profound gift that you received and that you now share with the world. Thank you for sharing that with, with our listeners today. Uh, thank you for sharing it with your audiences over years and years. I am so in love with your podcast. I love your, your, the, the people that you have on the guest interviews you have on. I love your Monday motivations. Um, your podcast, uh, live inspired is one of those that is at the top of my playlist every week of podcasts. And I would love to be able to, um, to, to take a little time today to do a podcast or trick, which I know that you participate in as well, to, to throw you a few rapid fire <laughs> questions. How's that well, it sound? sounds like I owe you. <laughs> as if you have a choice, first, right? <laughs> first things first, I think I owe you $20 for plugging the podcast as, uh, as effectively as you just did. So next time. Uh, I take you to Applebee's. Like apparently, the Oreo cook, okay. Oreo milkshake with two straws is on me. <laughs> that sounds great. We'll we'll kind of look like Lady and the Tramp on a plate of spaghetti, right? Angle and O'Leary drinking a milkshake. That'll be good, man. I get the chair. <laughs> yeah, we'll have that. That's Instagram worthy. <laughs> All right. So, first rapid fire question, and I'm altering this one uh, for the first time on an episode. So let's say you are on a desert island and you get to take one piece of art mm. with you, whether that is a book, a film, a Netflix series, a, I don't know how you're going to exactly get a Broadway production onto a desert island, but hey, let's say that. The one caveat I'm going to make is that this is a very well furnished island already so much like a hotel room you are already provided with the bible <laughs> what is the other piece of art that you would keep with you on awesome. a desert island so can i give you two answers sure the, the first one as you expanded i realized i could think a little bit outside the box but you began with artwork 
and in my office like behind me marcus there's all, all my like my family so i'm married i have four kids mm-hmm. and it's this wall of just these moments together with my family so those ladies kids leaders parents grandparents siblings that's why i work so that's my backdrop in front of me are the podcast guests that we've had on our show. You, by the way, were one of the first on our old, ch- old channel, so maybe it's time to bring you back to the new one. But it's all these amazing Let's folks that I've had that I look up to. So I love that wall. And then over to my left, it's there's some artwork up there, some made by my kids. Um, the, the farthest picture ever taken in the history of the world. It's taken off, the, I think it's the Mercury Space Shuttle. I forget how many miles away from Earth now, but it's just looking back and it's this beautiful picture of our universe with the Earth being this little baby pale blue dot. And so it's just a reminder that how small we are and yet we're here. And in my faith view, it's like God loves us enough in the midst of this massive universe to still make you and me and our, our families. Like that blows me away, totally blows me away. But the artwork I would take up to the top right, um, Rembrandt, I had to think of the, the artist's name. Rembrandt painted the prodigal son twice. He painted him at the high point of his success when he was married and when his kids were healthy, when he was rich, when everyone throughout Europe just looked up to him. And so he painted it and it's ignored these days because it just wasn't much of a painting. And then his second to last painting, he went back and he painted it again. And this time his wife had passed away. This time two of his kids had passed away. This time his wealth had been all spent and plurged and gone. This time he had nothing and he had lost everything that he built. But one more time he grabbed the brushes and he painted the return of the prodigal son. And it is this epic, gorgeous painting of a father with a big, thick, masculine left hand and a beautiful, dainty, loving, genteel, fully (laughs) feminine right hand pulling this broken child into his embrace, welcoming him, welcoming him back home. And I, I love the father. I love the son. I love the judgmental son on the side who's just looking with his hands like clasp, like, why is my dad being nice to my, my brother? Like everything about that picture speaks to me, including the genius that led to it. This, this brokenness of, of Rembrandt's life, allowing him to finally discover what grace is about. So I, I love that picture. Uh, by the way, the real one does not hang in my office. This is a cheap knockoff. Uh, the real one, I think, is in St. Petersburg, <laughs> Russia. If that's what you want. I don't want you breaking into my Kirkwood Beautiful. office right now, trying to get some, you know, s- something valuable, and you end up with like a ninety-two cent poster. But that's the artwork <laughs> I would take with me. That's beautiful. And then if you're like, and John, you can plug in. My my favorite play of Broadway is Les Mis. There's just Jean Valjean is such a lovable character angry and hot-headed and passionate and broken and everything else with this guy who just as life unfolds turns his heart head farther and farther and farther toward love and boldness and courage and doing the right thing even when it's awkward even when it's probably going to cost him his life and so I, I love the music behind that i love the the characters it's a beautiful book by victor hugo so i would bring the broadway cast of <laughs> of, of, of Les Mis and have them perform for me daily. <laughs> have them perform for you daily. Very good. <laughs> Very good. So that leads to another question then. If you could spend a day in the skin of or living the life of any fictional character, mm. who would you choose and why? That's awesome. So one of my favorite fiction books is... Oh man, is it called this? It's not the secret. It's the one with the little boy. I think he lives in Spain and he's looking for his, his like truth. It's written by, um, the alchemist, the alchemist. Okay. Uh, It's a, it's a book that I read in high school that I liked. It's a book that I read again when I was just beginning my first business that I thought was decent. And then as I was meeting you, Marcus, 18 years ago and starting this career as a speaker, picking up this book for the third time and reading this and his journey and ultimately realizing the thing he would look had looked for ultimately was this empty treasure chest of a mirror like just staring back at him like it was always there man it's you for me to be in the uh the, the, that world again of curiosity and seeking and uh, meeting with the alchemist him or herself to discover what ultimately matters most would be a cool journey to go on so i i've always liked that person's story 
that's that's a great example and a great book as well. It's probably been 20 years since I've read it, and I think I'm going to give it a read through again on your on your recommendation there. So lastly, let's say you open up your wallet this afternoon and you find that a $100 bill has magically appeared in your wallet. And the thing that's so magic about this $100 bill is that it can only be spent on yourself. You can only spend this on yourself. What what a rude question. (laughs) <laughs> well, today, later on today, I'm going to take my son on a driver's test. And so maybe what mm-hmm. I would buy is, God willing, he passes this thing and I need to somehow figure out where $21 are going to come from. So uh, I think that's the cost of getting a inch and a half by two inch card with his picture and name on it. So $21 of the dollars would go to the DMV, I guess, later on today. <laughs> I, I took my kids down to St. Louis U. Uh, where I went to college and um, we were just driving around. It's a beautiful campus and it's far prettier now physically than it was when I was there. The the buildings are still there, but the grounds are far more beautiful and much of the challenges around it have been erased. They've erased some of the the projects and they've erased some of the broken down buildings and it's just gone. But the systemic challenges that led to them being there are just pushed one farther block away, north, south, east and west. And so it's everywhere. So we ate together at Arby's on Saturday, and I'm like, you guys know the last time I was here, uh, I'm eating at this table, and I pointed to it by myself. And it's you know, wonderful meal, and the curly fries, and big old Dr. Pepper, and it's the good life, man. And a gentleman walked over to me. He sat down across from me, and he said, I'm hungry, too. And, you know, I never had anyone say that to me. And so uh, I said, well, can I, can I buy you lunch? And you know, never showed this, shared this story, Marcus, but that day I had lunch with a guy who I have not seen since, did not see before, was able to buy a, a roast beef sandwich and fries and a soda for, and we just had lunch together. And uh, I would love to go on down to Arby's, man, with a kid with a 16-year-old license and buy him lunch, buy me a little lunch, and just wait for an opportunity to look for someone else that's got a need. And I know you said it's got to be spent on you, but that is me. I've been all- that's that's that is you and i don't mean that, that out of you. self like that's out of like beautiful. service i mean like yeah. if if i could do that it just fills me up so um i would love to go around and, and uh, treat a couple people to lunch that's that's the greatest thing about giving isn't it, it, it it's 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 what we get mm. in return the, the feeling that we get in return is better than the gift itself in some instances and that is that that encounter that you described with that gentleman who I would assume is experiencing homelessness uh, is is one of those mystical, sacred moments that we get to have, right? And, And I'm sure you and I could share stories all day about the encounters that we've had on airplanes and in hotel lobbies and with people who we'd never met before and have never seen since that have left us changed it it people i don't think in general would want to trade places with either of us due to our physical traumas that we've endured however I wouldn't want to be anybody else. And I know you wouldn't want to be anybody else. I am lucky beyond measure. And from everything that you said today, you feel that way too. There's a lot in what you said that is so beautiful. And, and I think people who don't want to trade places with us don't recognize how good we've got it. So the idea of going through life yeah. with some of your struggles physically and the inability to see Yes, indeed. What a, what, a, what a hardship and something you would not have chosen. And yet, Marcus, your heart has allowed you to connect and see things that those of us with sight would never have seen, would never have heard, would never have experienced. And what a profound gift to see the world like that. And, and then for me, I walk in over and my hands, fingers are missing and I'm in physical pain from time to time. And because of that, I think my heart has been opened like yours has, and you're able to not only seek to be part of that love, but when it comes knocking on your door, 
when someone sits down and says, I'm hungry, or can you, can you help, or can you show up and do something with and for us? You and I know the answer. Like it's, it's easy. And for those of us who are buried on our cell phones, always looking down or always racing into the next meeting, we are at risk of mi missing the human being in need right in front of us. And if you miss enough of those, you may also miss the need that is staring back at you in the mirror. So we, we don't give ultimately, I think, so that we can feel better about ourselves. But in giving, we ourselves become far more whole and able to be far more effective in a marketplace that is longing for it. Most certainly, most certainly. Brother, I cannot thank you enough today for, for sharing your life, for sharing your wisdom and, and your guidance with not only myself and my listeners, but all of your listeners on the Live Inspired podcast. Uh, for all our listeners today, I am going to really encourage you to run out and get yourself a copy of either or both of John's books, actually, and your parents' book too. Can we can we real quick uh, talk about the various publications yes. that you have? Yes, we can take as much time as you'd like. And so, overwhelming yeah, odds is my yeah. mom and dad's book. And the cool thing about this book, Marcus, is they they dad got Parkinson's, came home, can't work, reflects on his life. You know, I, you know, we climb the ladder and then someone pushes out the ladder and you've got to ask yourself, why am I climbing to what direction? What matters? So he starts evaluating his life 18 years ago or so. And they realize one of the most important stories of their life is something they had never talked about and neither had their son. And it was the day he got burned and how the community showed up and how Grace showed up and how the healthcare team showed up. And and how even eventually John would meet this beautiful girl named Beth and how she showed up and the, the gift of their family. So they wrote a book, they printed a hundred copies and I think they've sold a hundred thousand subsequently out of their garage called Overwhelming Odds. That book led to me eventually embracing the story, which led to a chance encounter with Marcus Angle among many, many, many others who would invite me into their organizations and their, their hospital systems and their, their communities. So now I've written a book called On Fire, which became a number one national bestseller, as you said. And and then I was watching in all this travel, Marcus, like how we adults go through life. And it almost like as you check into a nice hotel, we're almost like bored and we don't even get to go outside of the beach. And so I'd contrast we adults with children and how they go through life. And so then I wrote a book on how that is. It's called In Awe, Rediscovering Your Childlike Wonder. And uh, I want... I want to live as boldly, as freely, as faithfully, as lovingly as my kids do naturally. And I wanted to write a book that when they outgrew this, the lessons they're teaching me, that they then could read for themselves to be reminded of, of what they once knew. So uh, th those are some of the books out there. If, the, if your listeners want to learn where they can learn more about any of this stuff, go to John O'Leary Inspires.com. So John O'Leary Inspires.com. John O'Leary Inspires.com and we will have those links in the show notes. And John, again, thank you so much for being with me today. Thank you for your work. This is Compassion and Courage, Conversations in Healthcare. I'm your host, Marcus Engel. This is the podcast where I teach compassionate communication, inspire resilience, and provide perspective. Thank you all so much for being here. Look forward to being with you next time.